Okay, I think we're ready to start. Uh, welcome here. Um, now we have Estonia and information warfare. What really happened in Estonia and what does it mean to us? This lecture is given from Gadi Evron. Just give him a hand. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. For those of you who are actually awake, um, I'm sure some of you have heard or read about stuff that happened in Estonia, but can somebody tell me in a very short sentence or just give me a hint of what you heard happened in Estonia? Anyone? You, right here. Oh, somebody picked. Every time I just point at somebody, somebody raises their hand. It's unbelievable. Oh, you, know. you gave up? No, then you tell me about Estonia. Just whatever you know. If you don't know anything, that's good too. No, he's shy. Anyone else? Yes. Over here and over here. Thank you. Okay, uh, Hold on. Anybody? The, oh, here's the mic. Okay, what I heard was that there was some struggle around some statue from World War II, and the Russians got pissed, and basically Estonia had everything running on the internet, including the parliament, and they were dust. They got dust. And well, you saved them something. Yeah, pretty much. Okay, so they got dust. They are on the internet heavily in the country. Yep, that's pretty much everything we heard in the news. But to be honest, except for maybe the New York Times report and a couple of other reports, there hasn't been much of any real information coming out about what happened there. And the main purpose of this talk is to really try and disperse this FUD that the press has been spreading, not through their fault, to be honest, and give you actual information about what happened. Now, this is not an extremely technical talk. So if you're looking for a technical talk, I have to apologize. And when we are done with this, I hope we'll be able to look at what I believe are some case studies for strategy for information warfare and how we can use this Estonian case study to learn about strategy for information warfare if we get there. So let's get started. Estonia information warfare and lessons learned. Information warfare meaning we're, we're going to throw away everything the Americans put in that sentence, you know, in that phrase. We're going to throw away psychological warfare and media warfare and everything else to be like that and talk only about computers and computer networks. Lessons learned. What can Estonia actually teach us, if anything? And of course, this sentence which is in which says, the first internet war. I had a very hard time with that sentence when I first saw it on, in the press, and I'll discuss that a little bit and why it got that name. So this representation, as you have seen here, is co-authored with Hiller, who is the Estonian cert manager, but he, have, he has never seen this presentation. He didn't even review it. And this is a very important note. Although I was there for just under a week, and I was a foot soldier, and later on I wrote the post-mortem and analysis recommendations for the, for the Estonians, all the credit, everything that happened there, all this information, it all belongs to them. I'm just telling the story right now. Which means, although all the credit is theirs, they haven't seen this presentation, all the blame is my, mine alone. We need to keep these two points in, in our minds when we see this presentation. So, who am I? My name is Gadi. It's a pleasure to meet you, if we haven't met before. I work for an Israeli vendor, which does a lot of uh, vulnerability assessment, whether it's, on actual, whether it's actual fuzzing to find new vulnerabilities or known vulnerabilities, different products. And we'll be talking about Estonia, or Albania? 
How many people here ever uh, read Dilbert? Not that many. Okay. So you guys don't get the joke. Well, Obonia in Dilbert is whenever he wants to speak about another country people do outsourcing to or anything else such as Nigerian scams, he basically picks on this small Eastern European third world country called Albania, which is fictitious and he made up. And of course their main export is mud and their main underground export is babies with beards or at least pictures of babies with beards. So you can contribute to them. I'm not really sure. So the first time I heard about Estonia I said yeah, I mean, I used to run the Israeli government CERT, and I used to run security operations for the Israeli government ISP. So, yet another attack. No big deal. Whenever there are political tensions, um, military tensions, immediately thereafter, it goes to the net, an online aftermath of sorts. So I wasn't very surprised. But a week passes, two weeks pass, and I email Hilar, and I say, hey, do you guys need any help? And he replied, when do I pick you up from the airport? <laughs> so I said, oh my god, I'm going to Albania. <laughs> Boy, was I wrong. So it's a small country in Eastern Europe. I don't think .ee has anything to do with Eastern Europe, but still. A little bit more than 1.3 million people. North of the three, not four, Baltic states. It's kind of Nordic. It's the northernmost, so it's just below Finland. When I was visiting Estonia, I hopped on a shuttle an hour, an hour and a half later. I was visiting F Secure's offices in Helsinki. Um, it has a flat tax. Everybody, everybody, no matter how much they make, pays the same tax. It has no tax on beer. Which is even, not even true for the camp. And of course, alcohol in general, if you care about that. And a whole lot of blonde girls everywhere. Yeah. So, <laughs> I love Estonia. I want to go back. If you, if, if, now, unrelated to all of this, if you ask any Russians about Estonia, you'll hear something completely different about them. There, some, there is a long history between the two, let's say, nations. So what, what's actually, what, what is Estonia after all? I mean, what are we talking about here? So after the Soviet Union fell, they started building everything from nothing. So what was the most advanced technology of the time? The internet. Let's build on that. They have 99, 98, 98 changes in every statistic I read, percent acceptance of online banking. Now this does not mean that all those who use the banks check their balance online. This means that if you stop somebody in the street and ask them, hey guys, when have you last been to a bank? And they will say, last evening. No. They will say, when have you last went to visit, when did you last go and visit an actual bank? And they'll say, oh, 10 years ago. Completely e-banking. The web channel is a completely new definition in Estonia. People don't go to an actual bank over there. They have ID cards which for people in the States would be shocking. And then add to that, they have PKI chips in there. So <laughs> I don't know what the, the people in the States will think about that, but I like it. And because of this, these technologies, they've actually held the last two elections, including the elections for the parliament, from home, online. Isn't that cool? As a security guy, I just went something like, But you get the point. And let's get down to earth a little bit. This happens sometimes in different schools, but every night, Hiller from the Estonian CERT goes online to the elementary grammar school website, sees what classes the, his children will have tomorrow morning, <laughs> and notes from the teacher, signs the notes online, maybe using his PKI chips, I don't know. I don't think he needs to. And um, it's pretty interesting. This country is really a leader when it comes to e-government or the internet in general. So the attacks are about to start because they know the 9th of May is approaching and that's a very important date. The 9th of May is the victory day over the Nazis. The Russian victory day over the Nazis. So they're preparing this strong web server and it, they put it on the defended network behind some extra firewall. 
and they figure, hey, you know what, let's talk to sites that may actually get under attack and tell them, make sure you have a plain text version to put up in case of an emergency. This is not extreme, but it seems likely, it seems like good preparations for an attack that may happen. And we need to understand that although Estonia has seen attacks in the past, they're pretty much virgins in online mass. Meaning they may, have, they may have had a lot of experience with the internet, they may have a very advanced infrastructure, but that infrastructure, because they're a small quiet country, has never been heavily attacked. They've never seen anything like this. So their infrastructure was ill-prepared for anything such as this. So let's go with the timeline. This is actually Friday the 20th. I've given this talk three times over the past week, so I figured I won't fix any of the mistakes in case somebody looks at them. Um, on Friday the 26th of April at 10 p.m., which is just before the 27th, the attacks start. Now, on the 27th of April at 2 a.m., the government ISP, yes, Estonia is an ISP for the entire government, just like Israel in the States. Again, I'm not sure I'll take that. <laughs> But um, the, uh, the Estonian ISP manager, uh, Margus, calls Hiller. Hiller was abroad and, and tells him, hey, you know, we're seeing these attacks. So what do you think we should do? And they discuss it a little bit, and they decide to basically move the websites to the protected server, because the current servers were not holding up. And they said, oh, yeah, we'll talk later. I'm getting on a plane back to Estonia right now. We'll see what happens. So. 6 a.m. on the 27th of April, which is Saturday. There are new targets, more, more websites under attack. And the new well-defended server is crumbling. It's not holding up against this attack. Well, okay. What do we do now? So they keep fighting, and at 6 p.m. on the 27th, they have a staff meeting at the ASO offices, which is, again, the government ISP. And they have the banks, representatives, all, all IT folks, right? The government people, the ISP people, uplink people from Alien, which is the direct uplink for the government uh, ISP, as well as the biggest ISP locally in Estonia. And they see increased attacks. Now, mostly, mostly spoofed, but still ICMP echo, DNS attacks, seen floods, traffic floods, nothing we haven't seen before, right? I can go on forever looking at packet captures, but I figure you have seen them before, you can see them again. So, at this point, they realize these attacks are something else. There was an increase in traffic, which is between 100 times and 1,000 times what they're used to or capable of handling. And let me ask you a question. You don't really have to answer this time. How many of us, when we buy tubes or bandwidths, prepare 100 times or 1,000 times more than our maximum need. None of us. That just doesn't happen. So the reason why this is 100 times to 1,000 times the regular use is because they couldn't really measure anymore. The taxes were so big and they were so busy and overtaxed that measurement was the last thing on their minds. So they proceeded with incident response. They know how to do that. So. We'll talk a little bit about incident response later. So the 28th of April afternoon, they have another staff meeting. And they are saying, look, these attacks are really successful. We are not handling them well. We are trying. We're going and getting them all the time. But we have still not reached the point where we are on top of them. And they realize, <coughs> again, we have seen this as a big attack earlier. And we realized this wasn't anything regular. But this is really something weird. And they reached the conclusion this was a cyber riot. Now, at the same time, in Tallinn, in the streets, there was a riot. There was a mob going around, which was built, of course, of Russian uh, people in, um, I should say, Soviets, because they were raising the Soviet flag, in the streets of Tallinn. Now, this all started because the Estonians moved a, sta a war memorial, a statue, and some unknown graves beneath it to a military graveyard outside of the city. Now, the old political and historical issues between the two people are things that I really don't want to go into, so you'll have to read about it online. 
or ask somebody. But it's really, dif really difficult and complicated. It begins with a long, long time, maybe even a hundred years, I'm sorry, I don't remember the exact uh, number of years right now, of occupation by the Russians. Then Nazi Germany came along and saved Estonia. They're perceived as basically saviors. And then the Russians came back and controlled Estonia in the Soviet fashion up to the fall of the Soviet Union. So Estonians don't li really like Russians. On the other end, the Russians don't really like Estonians for various reasons. And again, nothing against the two people. In Israel, about a fifth of the population or a sixth of the population are Russians or people who originally came from Russia. But um, I really sat down and tried to understand what was going on in there. And I tried to understand which side I like more. And every time I reached a conclusion on one side that I like more, I saw something childish being done by the other side, and I changed sides. Eventually, I decided I can't pick sides. So this is the most I'm going to talk about the politics. You'll have to research the history yourself. And honestly, coming from Israel, I have my own problems. So let's move on. Now, this riot is up in the streets. At the same time, which is amazing, people see posts to the Russian forums, blogs, generally saying, hey, look what, and this is a quote, the fucking Estonian fascists, or Nazis, depending on your preference, did. Now, Russians were pissed. Russians really take to heart the 20 or 30 million uh, soldiers they lost during the Second World War. So the blogosphere is full of messages and the Russian population basically follows and attacks. So they said, hey, this is not a group of hackers or cyber terrorists or whatever else you want to call them. This is a population attacking us. This is a riot. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more. So all these really websites, let's call them this, the Russian-speaking or Russian-language blogosphere came alive. It was fired up. It was pissed. Now, the Estonians, on the other hand, said, look, we have been responding in emergency mode. We haven't slept for two or three days. We need to take a hold of the situation and go to routine mode. Routine mode is on Monday. This was a lucky strike. The attack, well, maybe it was lucky, maybe it wasn't. The attack happened on a weekend. We need to make sure Monday morning the government is operational, the country is operational, everything works. So by order of a very annoyed <laughs> Estonian third manager, he wasn't the direct commanding officer or anything, they all went on to sleep. They all said, we'll be back here 6 a.m. tomorrow morning on Monday morning and make sure everything works for 8 a.m. Now, this is from um, <laughs> an Estonian newspaper, which I don't have the address for yet. And that's why this presentation, if you get it online, will not have this picture there because of copyright issues until I find it. But I think it's very cool. So let's analyze. You have this supposedly Russian young man with his Kalashnikov or AK-47, depending if you're from the States or not. And he's basically firing at his computer screen because he's pissed what he's seeing. I'm just, you know. And OK, let's move on. It's a very cool picture, you got to admit. So that's basically the Russian blogosphere. I really wish the artist could have heard your, your applause, but. So this is um, written in Latin rather than Russian. Pinguem Estoniske Servera, I guess. And if you search for that on Google, you will still find, find thousands of websites. Some of them disappeared. That basically instruct people on how to attack. Now, any Russian or Russian-speaking guy or girl who can read that for us, please. Anybody? This is a very shy crowd. Seriously, I had a lecture yesterday, and everybody was shy as well. Oh, come on! Oh, well. 
So basically, um, this tells them um, to attack. They're pissed, right? If you want to get back at people, etc. And it instructs them to open a command window or a console window and do the following command, which is ping on an Estonian server. Now, this may seem silly, but when the entire Eston uh, sorry Russian blogosphere goes and does ping, enter, app, ping, enter, up, enter, up, enter, up, enter, up, enter, up, enter, it may sound silly, it may be pointless and useless, but hey, enough of this and some DSL line will go down. <laughs> and honestly, it got them all fired up, and that was the important thing. So. Let's look at some tools. This was just a batch script dot bat that automated it and put it in a loop, which is pretty cool, I suppose. You could download a lot of other scripts, a lot of other tools, and the interesting thing is that as the Russian blogosphere get, got fired up, more and more people got involved. And as more and more people got involved, naturally, more and more tools were released. This was made very, very easy. <coughs> Sorry. It was made very, very easy for people to attack Estonia. They didn't need to be experts. Now, the interesting thing about the Russian blogosphere is that there appeared, as the same way that everything appeared all over the Russian blogosphere and told, told people how to attack and why to attack and got them all fired up, there are periodic updates. They basically, either this was the first self-adjusting, self-learning attack that I've personally ever seen, or it was responding to defenders' action in Estonia. So, your call. The other interesting thing is, on the Estonian side, people who spoke Russian went and read the same web website, the same blogs, the same forums, and they could read what these attackers were planning, what tools they were releasing for the population to use. And they could, for example, and this is usually social networking, their social, social wealth. They would tell other people, and eventually it will all sink hold to the CERT, even though it wasn't organized. It was ad hoc intelligence. And the CERT would come up and say, tomorrow's DNS day. Prepare your DNS servers. This is another tool. I took this from the F-Secure blog or a web blog, which is called DDoS Attacker, again, against Estonia. Neat. More importantly, just let's look at the statistics of the sizes. This is just against the ASO, ASO in the first weekend. The ASO is a 10 megabit line, and the initial filtering was, after the initial filtering, they had about uh, 1.2 megapackets per second. This is from four megapackets per second of ICMP echoes. Now, they employed Cisco Guard, which just happened to have sitting around um, accumulating dust because they wanted to do a pilot or a demo, and they got it down to 150 kilo packets per second. They configured it a little bit more, and this is a mistake in the numbers, but basically from the original 1.2 megapackets per second, they got it down to three kilo packets per second. This is not final numbers in any way. I'm not sure we'll ever have final numbers, but this is a work in progress, and that's important to mention. Now, looking at the traffic, and again, we can't be sure yet of everything, there was about three megapackets of ICMP echo, one megapacket of SYN attacks, 150 kilopackets of various other attacks, and only out of the four megapackets per second, three kilopackets of legitimate traffic. Now, this was the weekend, so that makes sense, but just to give you a sense of it, it wasn't anything new. Meaning, we have seen bigger attacks. What's the big buzz all about, right? And this is only against the ASO. But we need to realize a few things. One, this was pretty big. Four megapackets may not be the biggest attack we've ever seen. It may not be the attack against the root servers just happened recently. But it's still big. Relatively small compared to that. Still big. More importantly, and we'll repeat that later on, big enough to take them down. They handled it. But that's the important point. Now, it was sizable. 
It was just right for Estonia. And here is the really important point. Whether it was the smallest attack, whether it was just one packet, the impact to Estonia was still significant. This is what really matters here. Now, although we have seen these attacks before, the scale was impressive, meaning from all these many, many different people just sending ping, enter, ping, enter, to the most advanced attacks. Once the blogosphere got fired up, a lot of people said, well, I know security, I know hacking, why should I do ping, enter, ping, enter when I can use my botnet? Right? So everybody was fired up, and they got fired up as well. So there are a few attacks of interest that I would like to, well, two attacks of interest that I would like to discuss. The first was a spam or an email attack against the Estonian parliament's mail servers. And again, this is not final, there, there are not the final numbers, but it originally resulted in two days of downtime. And considering a country that's fully reliant on its internet infrastructure, two days of downtime for the parliament could have been catastrophic if it wasn't in the weekend. So that's a very interesting attack. And there are more than two routers that crashed, or routers, whatever you, however you want to pronounce them. But these two were interesting. One was just misconfigured. It allowed people to connect directly to the router. Oops. The second just couldn't handle the traffic again. If it's supposed to handle the maximum amount of load that's currently going on, maybe a, bit, a little bit more than that, 100 to 1,000 times more, even if you're a far away node, not good. So let's look at this MRTG graph. This is one of the botnet attacks, or all of the attacks stuck together that happen with the botnet attacks. And you can notice these highs here. And if any of you ever dealt with botnet attacks against networks, you'll know that in some cases, the attackers actually measure you, meaning they launch some sort of attack of two minutes to five minutes long, nothing much more than that. They launch a lot at you, and they disappear. Between an hour to maybe three weeks later, depending on what they feel like, or any other parameters they may choose to use, suddenly all hell breaks loose. Exactly at the right rate to bring you down, not wasting resources. So we can't be sure this is what happened in Estonia. We can't be sure that's a measuring attack, but sure as hell looks like it. Now, there were some other types of attacks, but when talking about botnets, the interesting thing, again, we do not have complete coverage. The interesting thing is that, as far as we could tell, all the botnet attacks came only from outside of Estonia, meaning computer, compromised computers outside of Estonia, none from within. I'm not sure if these botnets just happened to not have any bots or infected computers inside of Estonia, whether they're doing some OPSEC trying to save their botnet because they did Basically, if you had a bot inside of Estonia and the ISP suddenly saw that one of the attack sources came from its own users or the users of its neighbor, they would pick up the phone or fire up their keyboards, <laughs> find out what command and control server that bot was reporting to, and there goes your botnet. So it could be OPSEC making sure that the attacks only come from outside of Estonia. It could also be a plan, because later on, they did launch attacks from within Estonia. Up to this point, there was just one kid who did ping, enter, ping, enter, ping, enter from within Estonia. It was picked up, it was released later on, nothing really happened to him, but that's an interesting point to consider. Now, let's look at this MRTG graph. At some point in one of the, somewhere in the blogosphere, I believe this was on F-Secure's website too. I didn't see it there, I was looking for it today and I couldn't find it. Somebody made a comment about opening a PayPal account and raising funds. They basically said, hey, let's hire a botnet. I wanna buy a botnet to attack Estonia. So a guy came along and said, hey, why pay for a botnet? Here's two. <laughs> Yeah, so the interesting thing is that here on Friday, 
there was a botnet attack and suddenly exactly at midnight, which is 3 a.m. Estonian time, midnight GMT time, one of the attacks just dropped. Now, it could be a coincidence, it could be something else, but it could also be a hired botnet attack for 24 hours. It's interesting, I can't tell for sure, but uh, hey, you know, it's interesting. So, there were some other types of special attacks going on. One example was something that we have seen before, but not very often, usually used by spammers or other botnet controllers when they're really pissed. They would create a special sample, a special bot, completely new code base. They would then attack you. Now, how did these samples get on the machines they're attacking from? Because these samples do not connect to a command and control server to get instructions. They do not propagate. They do not infect other computers. How did this botnet come to be? So what basically happens usually, it could go in different ways, is that the bad guys, as we call them here, the attackers, take the new samples, which, have, again, have hard-coded IP addresses of what they're supposed to attack, no connections to the outside world, so they can't be detected that easily, or the botnet can be stopped, and they drop it on a current botnet. If you look at all these different computers attacking, you are likely to find the same sample, or at least connected to the same command and control servers, from a different sample on all these machines. So, new sample, unknown before, just dropped somewhere and launched an attack. That's pretty interesting. Now, how about the incident response? Well, it's pretty basic, but, well, let's begin. I mean, the first question they ask themselves are, what are the sources of the attacks? Who is attacking us? Then, what are the targets they're attacking? Another basic question. And if there is a botnet attack, what is the CNC server? What is the command and control? Let's find it and take it down. Let's stop that attack. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Estonia's infrastructure was ill-prepared for such an attack. I can't blame them for that. What really saved Estonia was the response. Unbelievable incident response. And we'll talk about it now. So, what's the main goal of incident responders? Their main goal was basically to bring systems back online, or as it usual would be, don't even let them go down in the first place. Thing with incident response is, though, it's after the fact. Something bad already happened. The shit already hit the fan. So they basically decided, stop. It, let's just read this. Not responding by identifying attacks, but rather by identifying their impact, meaning too many sources to even look at them, too many targets, too, many, too much attacks. So it, Opinion. Just, let's try and find the impact. What went down? What can't we contact right now? Let's respond by that. It's a change in tactics. So, in 28, in the meeting that we mentioned, there were other mitigation approaches that were uh, made. One is, again, don't concentrate on the sources, concentrate on the targets, which becomes the impact. And technical analysis, again, issue of lim limitation of resources, don't do analysis in any way except when you would have a clear effect in mitigation. We need to concentrate on mitigation, not research. This is not always true, but in some cases we have taken incident response and made it about forensics, about re retaining evidence. Incident response is very basic in, in most cases. It's about responding to the incident, stopping it, containing it. That was the Estonians. Now, much of what we'll discuss from this point on is about culture, because in a very interesting fashion, a lot of the attacks themselves, the way they defended, were related to culture. And I'm not sure how much regular warfare is directly attached to culture, but hey, that's pretty interesting, and you'll see why, I hope. So, Estonia is in a unique situation. Everyone knows everyone, which means you can get in a car and drag people out of bed, which is pretty neat, except for a person in bed. Now, 
they're very small, which means their online presence is very, very concentrated. Which means they can do some things which, for example, the United States or very large countries with a very large presence will find very difficult to do, such as block incoming connections to the country for certain targets. Again, technology varies. This does not have to be blocking incoming connections. It could be something as simple as saying, anybody connecting to the banks can only connect to the banks from our own internal internet exchange. They have ticks, the Tallinn Internet Exchange. So let's discuss the cert. I'm calling it Estonia's luck, but it's not luck. They were there. So response in Estonia was amazing. It's basically what saved Estonia. It's basically what made this stack disappear. And the cert is basically two people, Hilar, which we mentioned earlier, and Ivar. There are other people in Estonia that responded, such as the professionals in the ISPs. They were ama amazing, honestly. There are the professionals in the banks. There are the system administ network administrators, other professionals in the news websites, not necessarily reporters, right? All these guys basically work together. Now, yes, the CERT would officially be the one responding and coordinating incidents, but it does not have the official authority to do so, as far as I know. What, does, what did happen was, one, Hilar is a very special guy. He's very friendly, he's very nice, he also has no time for bullshit. And when something happens, he will go and drag you out of bed if he needs you. In one case, the police needed to move a website which was under attack. So in a matter of minutes, the, or an hour, the server was already heading to some other ISP. Everybody helped everybody. There are a few factors that contributed to the CERT becoming the leader in this attack. And these were by consensus and by facts of what actually happened. This is in the field. So the first thing was the CERT was there. And they had nothing to do, no network to maintain other than Estonia's. So they were working on it. Can't argue with that. The second issue was the first attack sites, the first attack network, were the government, which means the CERT sits on the same floor as the ASO, the Estonian government ISP. So when these attacks started, they worked with ASO. They helped coordinate the attacks. Margus called Hilar when he was abroad. Another issue was some of these sites, and basically the, the, one of the uplinks for the ASO is Elion, which is, again, the largest local ISP. Other, many, many other sites in Estonia are hosted by Elion. So by the time that Elion was already coordinating with CERT and ASO, other sites got attacked. It basically synced to the same mitigation process. Of course, again, there was Hilar, <laughs> and Hilar is a really great guy, and he gets things done. So the CERT, whether it's by a lot of different uh, contributed fact contributing factors or to the way Estonians worked, became the leader of this amazing bunch. Now, this is local incident response, but as we know, the internet is global. If you don't have a bot in Estonia and you need information about where the CNC is, you take it from somewhere else in the world. You are getting attacked from other places in the world. Your computer, your computer, my computer, and your computer may be attackers. Your security may be reliant on my security because my computer is compromised. The internet is a global infrastructure. It's not a critical infrastructure that's only national. Estonia realized that. And they said, we are too busy. How can we deal with all these incidents, reporting it to the world, getting things done to mitigate the attacks from the outside? So they talked to four different European certs. I told them, be our escalation node. Like when you call an ISP and get escalated, same thing. Deal with it for us. Please help. So. In Germany, in Finland, and in Slovenia, these certs came through and said, hey, we'll help. Sure, why not? These certs coordinated and launched all these different emails for abuse reports. They worked with the Internet Security Operations Community, as well as others worked with the Internet Security Operations Community and helped directly. There were others involved, such as Arbor Networks, me, other guys. 
So that was taken care of as well. Now, although it was necessary, and although these people did do a lot of work, one of the things that was realized, that although all this help was necessary, as things went, it failed. This process failed. And not because these people weren't good, and not because they didn't help out, but because they didn't help out fast enough. They couldn't get, they couldn't effect change fast enough to help Estonia. Now, Estonia is in predicament. They're successful technologically. And this is pretty well known. The more technological a country is, the more reliant it is on technology. If you're reliant on the internet, for example, then your vulnerability will be in the internet. And the more reliant you are, the more vulnerable you become. I'm all for success, I'm all for developing business and functionality. Security comes second, but security should be remembered, as we have seen here. So Estonia is not the United States. It's not Germany, it's not Israel. I'm not sure what each of these countries has as far as reliance on the internet and technology. I can tell you we are not as reliant on it or as much of users as Estonia is. I'm not sure where we're going there, but in some ways Estonia is the future. It's a window to the future. They're completely reliant, and we'll discuss how in a second. Being completely reliant, we can see what would potentially happen to us. We know we're not as reliant. Maybe if we get attacked successfully, which is not a given, there will be some sort of economic you know, recession, maybe even a depression. Estonia would be in much deeper trouble. Now, this is about the banking industry. As we mentioned, most citizens in Estonia have not been to a real bank in over a decade. This may be an overstatement, maybe some of them did go, I'm not sure, but you get the point. Now, during downtime, some of Estonia's banks were not reachable for a while. Not a long while, but a while. Client transactions, other transactions could not happen. It was all done online. Meaning, you could not buy basic groceries. As Hiller puts it, it's about milk, bread, and gas, or petrol. This became the critical infrastructure, and that's what we're going to discuss. Because I'm not talking about other e-banking or online banking threats or vulnerabilities right now. I'm discussing only reliancy, resilience, fallback. We'll get there. So progress is good, resilience and fallback. If we used to have four bank branches, and now when everybody is using the web channel, which is very cheap and very useful, and the banks, of course, or other e-commerce sites want to maintain it. What do we do? We remove some branches. Where we used to have four branches, for example, now we would have only one. But that leaves us with no resilience or fallback, because if, if the web channel or the internet channel disappears, dissipates, then what? I'm all for progress, but we need to keep these things in mind. Now, Let's define critical infrastructure then. It was the private and business sector. It wasn't transportation. It wasn't energy. It wasn't SCADA systems. I'm not saying these usual, let's say, military infrastructures or civil infrastructures aren't important. But what got immediately attacked was the business and private sector. And when these got attacked, the country was impacted immediately. The ISPs the banks, and yes, the media, the press, websites. Silence on the radio if you ever learned radio or communication. Very bad. I'm not talking about manipulation of these websites right now. I'm just talking about emergency, and these things disappear. These websites disappear. People need information. Now, another critical infrastructure was, yes, you and me. Now, when it comes to critical infrastructure, the first thing people usually consider is, let's call it the military one, or the critical infrastructure, national infrastructure. Then some consider the next level, which is the economic one, the private one, the business one. 
that works. And then, some of us, barely some of us, consider the citizens. Consider cybercrime today, consider computers, consider botnets. Can you give me the number? Just throw out the number, even think about it. How many computer, how much of all this population of users do you know of? How many computers can you just go to and be sure that you will not find, find any sort of malware on? Spyware, malware, botnets, whatever else it may be. I don't count how many are infected, I'm counting how many are not. How many of these are botnets? I stopped counting a long time ago. So, yes, home computers, home consumers, users, clients, the civilians themselves, they are now the critical infrastructure. And in Estonia, it proved to be the case. Consider all the attacks from outside of Estonia, which came from botnets, but this is not about botnets. Then they started attacking from within Estonia. It was regular botnet attacks, but still, consider what might have happened, because this is a case of what did happen. Now, we talked about malicious code and all these computers that have it, about botnets. Let's just run away from Estonia for one minute and talk about Winnie. Anybody here about, heard about Winnie? Yes, you did. Winnie is basically a Japanese language P2P file sharing application. It's not that good, but it's in Japanese. So I'm going to exaggerate again and say that every, it's not every, computer in Japan has Winnie on it. There have been some leaks, there have been some secret information that was leaked because of Winnie being on computers it shouldn't have been on. But consider an, an alternative, and by the way, the Winnie author was actually arrested. I believe he's now released, but I'm not sure how willing he will be to patch Winnie if anything ever happens. There are people going around having Winnie zero days. I hear about them every day. I don't believe what I hear, but any basic program has vulnerabilities in it. Now, if Winnie exists on so many computers in Japan, it's just one way to explain the critical infrastructure that users or home computers pose. Not necessarily an immediate risk, but it is certainly a risk. I don't envy the Japanese. They arrested the guy, but not for this. It was for copyright issues. Not necessarily botnets. So, who was behind the attacks? <laughs> Everybody wants that answer, don't you? So, this is a kind of used joke by now, but hey, what the heck. The KGB! Now, the KGB no longer exists. It probably exists under a different name. But it wasn't them, in my opinion. Let's look at this. So we have seen some coordination going on. We don't know if it was ad hoc, some sort of loose coupling of people, organizations working together after they started working, or if it is a planned assault. We can't really tell from technological information only. And we don't have that many logs to begin with because of all the, the mess that was happening. But what is some sort of meme a blogosphere epidemic. Maybe we have seen memes spread around the blogosphere before. This was very quick, though. This was very organized for a meme. I'm not really sure about it, but hey, who am I? Could be. And there is one thing we need to remember, that the internet is perfect for plausible deniability. Even if I did attack, even if it did come from my computer, I could always say, well, no, I didn't. Somebody else attacked through my computer. It's called the Trojan, Ho the Trojan horse defense. And hey, it could be true. So, who knows? Spoofed attacks, button attacks, compromised machines everywhere. Which brings us down to in information warfare, and this is very basic for information warfare. You may know who your rival is, you may know who your enemies are, you can point at them right now. But you may not know who your attacker is actually attacking you is. That's a critical understanding for information warfare. Let me ask you a question. Information warfare, or warfare in general, can anybody please define in regular warfare what a battle is for me? Work with me, people. What's a battle? You know, battle? B-A-T-T-L-E? Anybody? I'll pick somebody. 
What? How long? Two people, one people at a time? One person at a time? A process. Okay, a process. And you wanted to say? And an engagement between representatives of two representatives from two sides. Anyone else? Let's say it is a meeting of two opposing forces, just for now. It could be a process, it could be an engagement. Can we agree on that? Can anybody think about the internet and tell me what a battle would look like? What are the two sides? Do you even know who your attacker is? A basic question. Can you move, can you maneuver your defensive forces to become offensive forces or your offensive forces to become defensive? This, what? You don't want to do that. <laughs> it's not clear. And the very interesting thing, which I usually say at the beginning of the talk, that for information warfare, we have a very interesting structure of information or knowledge. We have the very top. The very top says, hey, this is national security strategy. This is our general, a general strategy for war. We know there is war. We know there is risk. We know the, the potential impact of world destruction. Right? Then we drop down and go all the way down here. We may have some information along the way, dots, filling in data, or some examples of the past. But as far as I know publicly, there is nothing there. Tactics, logistics, how do you plan a battle? You drop all the way down to the very basic form of computer-to-computer -computer attacks, packets moving on a network, or equivalent. Estonia, although there may be some other examples that are public, although there are some, maybe some other examples which are not public, Estonia gives us a case study which may not always be true. It may not always hold true for any engagement. And you consider the term. I mean, it's amazing. I read in a paper f f a year ago, a US general said, saying, it will be a while before we are fully engaged in cyberspace. Now, forget everything else. Just think about this term, engaged in cyberspace. Mind-blowing. But I can't really keep t talk further on information warfare because we don't have time. What I can say is, theories aside, let's throw them aside, Estonia is a culture of full disclosure. It's unbelievable. The reason we have all this information, the reason we can study this, the reason we can take the case studies and, and see what actually happened, see the strategies that we may ascertain from this, is because Estonians believe in full disclosure. I spoke to Hilar and said, look, Hilar, I want to write something about infrastructure. And I'm mentioning something here that could put a target on somebody, and that's not good for your infrastructure. And he said, so? Now, he didn't mean it that way. I'm, of course, making it sound very badly. But the point is, if the Estonians have a problem, they want it known. They want it public. They say, let's make it public. We will fix it. It's a complete opposite of what we're used to. Full disclosure doesn't come next or second. It comes first. Unbelievable. A friend of mine heard a talk about the Estonians' implementation of the PKI uh, IDs for the country. And the guy comes on stage and says, here is where we succeeded. Cool. And he doesn't say, here are challenges we faced or issues that are yet to be resolved. He says, here, are, here is where we failed. Very honest. I love Estonians or at least the culture. <laughs> the blonde girls too, but you get the point. So let's look about this. Who was behind the attacks? We can actually see several. I'm listing four, and these are the main four, the only four, I'm not sure right now, indications of who was behind the attacks. So first, it was started virtually the same time as the incidents in Tallinn streets. Weird. It wasn't even in the news as far as I know. The Russian speaker in a Russian language blogosphere was updated periodically responding to the defender's actions. Interesting. Originally, no bots, or virtually no bots, attacked from within Estonia, and we've discussed that. And 
the button at the attack that was specially crafted. Again, interesting, I guess. So, the Russians are coming, or not. Um, this could be a coincidence, but even each of these incidents alone show some coordination. So again, ad hoc, loose coupling of people working together, a full assault. It's not yet known, I doubt we ever will with this technological information only or technical information. Now, what did the Russians? Absolutely yes. Was it Russia? I would say absolutely not, but that's an opinion. You can read what the Russian politicians say and what the Estonian politicians said, and you can see that the Russian politicians don't really do much as far as wanting to attack, but they think it's pretty cool that the attack is happening. At least my opinion of what's been written. But nothing really saying that it was them unless you read the news and statements. So we can discuss a little bit of strategy. And it took me a while to come up with this thing called unwitting zombie fifth column. I tried to come up with an explanation for how do we call this warrior or participant where you may be a soldier in an army and at the same time a traitor or not. You can, if you're firing on your own forces, there are terms for this. There are traitors, right? There is friendly fire. What's a botnet? What's a compromised host? I'm not talking about the spoofed attack right now, although single way, one way, uni, it could be the same thing. So a fifth column is the term I came with after a lot of searches, although it's pretty well known, originally coming from Leo or Lev. Yeah, um, oh my god, I can't believe I forgot his name. Um, oh well, in Russia. And uh, Trotsky, Lev Trotsky in Russia, uh, who came up with this, but of course I'm sure it's not that new about the term, but it's really attributed, and this is from two different Wikipedias in different languages, <laughs> which say different things, originally attributed to years later the Spanish Civil War, where the general was asked, how much, uh, how many forces do you have? What's the size of your force? And he said, I have four columns, and my fifth column is in Madrid. We're not sure if he meant people of Madrid will rise up and help him, or an actual infiltrated force inside of Madrid, but it's interesting. So how do you call a soldier without knowledge fires both at you and your enemy? <laughs> so I have this biological war, for example, which is, for example, let's do a prisoner exchange, but infect the other side. Didn't really catch that much. We spoke about botnets and weenie. Now, Martin, Martin von Krebel discussed 30 years ago the issue of we're not lo no longer going to fight countries, but rather organizations. It sounds pretty clear, but it wasn't back then. He was the first to say it. I'm not in any way comparing myself to Martin, but I'm saying we're fighting populations, at least online. What we have seen is pretty interesting. So let's talk about the attacker strategy briefly. Cyber terrorism or internet riot or cyber riot, I hate everything that goes with cyber. Um, not exactly the same thing. We've seen a population or a mob come to life. We have seen what I would call war by proxy followed by anonymous war or the other way around. And pretty, pretty much similar to mob control or mass psychology. Let's consider if you're a part of a mob and you're going around and saying things like, hey, everybody, or maybe you're pushing to the right, or maybe there are 20 people with you in the mob and you're pushing to the right, the mob is very likely to move to the right. If you're saying, down with that statue, and you, are, you alone or 20 people with you, the mob is likely to take that statue down. So the whole idea of the blogosphere, the internet, and online mob control, online mass psychology, I would say that's taking psychological warfare and putting it, or intelligence warfare, and putting it on the offensive. I believe this will be, this will receive a lot more attention in the future. This is interesting. Now, the second thing we discussed already, which is attacking from the world and from within Estonia, respectively. Attacking the business and private infrastructure. 
You're talking the routing infrastructure, which comes last. Amazing. Now, the defender strategy, in my opinion, was a lot more interesting. All this strategy, I doubt anybody actually went and said, hey, let's strategize, let's create a, some tactics for this attack. Coming from the outside, looking at what was happening, I believe I was able to, to ascertain some strategies that were used. But this is plain hindsight. I doubt anybody planned. And I know on the defender side, although there was a lot of planning technologically, they didn't really think strategy at the time. Now, the defender's goal, as we discussed, was simple. Maintain regular service and stability of the country's internet. Now, Klausowicz, if there are any Klausowiczans in the crowd that are going to kill me for misinterpreting him, basically said defense is more powerful than attack. Because the further an attack goes, the more logistical support you need to leave behind, the less soldiers you have, well, the attacking par party can get organized. You get deeper into their territory, they become more aggressive. So, in information warfare, I'm not sure Klausowicz was right, actually I'm pretty sure right now I may change my mind by tomorrow that he was wrong. The interesting thing about information warfare though, is that even though there may be a main body of what we believe information warfare may be, there are a lot of niches. As these niches very, very easily can become the main issue of how information warfare is fought. We can just throw everything away, take a niche, use it, and it will be that. The other thing is, fighting does not necessarily mean warfare. So, fighting in information warfare can be a part of an overall war. But information warfare by itself, as warfare, is in my opinion not comparable, for example, such as maritime warfare is comparable or analogous to aerial warfare. Different, but same, same. Information warfare is not. It's a new type of warfare. It can be used as an extra strategy, an extra tool, an extra weapon, but it's not the same when used alone or by itself. And it can be irregular warfare. It can be a weapon of mass destruction. It can also be intelligence. Let's go back to the issue at hand. So, you already had some, aired some of the defensive strategy as we went along, but I really think this should be told the story. We don't have much time. We have about five minutes left. Maybe. I, we're already over time, so I'll try and make it short. So, strategies and tactics, really in a nutshell. Crowd control. In the streets of Tallinn, we mentioned there was a riot. Well, all this was happening. Okay, that's nice, or not. But they did something very interesting. They controlled what happened. They contained the situation. Now, incident response, although we invented it anew in computer security, in computer sciences, computer networks, originally comes from the military. Incident response is based on capability and policy. Meaning, you, if you're capable, you'll jump to an incident and take care of it if you have the policy approval, according to what the policy states. If you're capable only of lesser work and you need special forces to come, you would jump to the incident as fast as you can, contain the situation, and wait for somebody who is both capable and allowed to do the work. So in Tallinn, what they did is they closed the crowd in one place. Culturally, and this is not limited to Russia, of course, Russians love to drink. Yeah. And they, cl they contained the crowd in a liquor area. And by 5 a.m., all the Russians just left home to sleep. So that's kind of interesting from that perspective. But I'm not sure if this is true. This is just something I heard that Paris may be an example of. In Paris, they push the crowd away. Right? This is more policing than military strategy. But by pushing the crowd away, they make sure the entire... St Again, I'm not sure if it's really happening in Paris, but it's an example. They make sure the entire street catches fire and all the windows are broken. So, what happened on the internet is that, for example, the president's website was under attack. Now, the president, like the queen, is more representative. He is somebody too small to the cameras. He has some extra... Um, 
things going with him, same as Israel and uh, other, other countries, but the prime minister runs the country. So the president's website was under attack. It was taken down. And again, resources are spread thin. What do you do? You want to protect the banks. They said, in, I mean, they cared, of course, they met with the president, they talked. But when it come down, came down to it, in their culture, they would say, so? I mean, aside from face value, pride, why should they care if the president's website is down? Does it impact national security? Does it impact their ability to survive, much like the banks would if they get attacked? No. So that's one strategy. The other strategy, of course, was the parliament's mail servers. They said, this is where we draw the line. Here is the line we stand. So somebody would attack the parliament's mail server, and they would bring it back up. Now, you guys tell me, and please tell me, don't be such a dead crowd. If you bring something down, what would the attackers do if you bring it back up? Try harder. Meaning they would take it down again. And if you bring it back up again, what would the attackers do? Attack harder yet again. So what basically happened was they drew attention. They basically did some deception, right? And basically drew all the, attentions of the, the attention of the attackers, or a lot of it anyway, from attacking other different targets to just that one website. And eventually, sorry, a mail server. And eventually, they just left it alone. Now, different strategies, different tactics can be maybe attributed, can be analyzed if it was good or bad, but it is at the very least interesting. Because let's consider the president's website again and consider the broken windows theory. Uh, the, it, they came up with it in New York City and eventually Giuliani came along and make it, made it bigger, bigger. Over there, it wasn't exactly about broken windows, it was about graffiti. But the theory says, if one window is broken, it's left broken over there for the night. The next day, all the windows in the street will be broken. I didn't really understand the theory, so a friend of mine came along and said, okay, let me explain it to you. If anybody going to offend it easily, please leave. <laughs> if you go into a bathroom, something like in the camp, and it stinks, and it's really, really uh, ugly and dirty and smelly, and you bleh, don't even want to go there. You're very careful not to touch anything. You pee really quickly. You barely aim if you're a guy anywhere. If you're a girl, I don't even want to think about it. And you run out without even flushing the toilet. Just run out of there. And you probably spray the entire bathroom with pee. Now, <laughs> on the other end, what? I won't come to your house. So on the other end, if you go into a squeaky clean bathroom, it's all clean and shiny. You'll go inside. You'll say, wow, that's cool. And you'll be very careful. You'll even aim a little bit. And if something spills over, you'll even maybe sometimes try and clean up a little bit, you know, after yourself and leave. So that's the broken uh, Windows theory in the way that I understood it by a friend. Never mind. So there was intelligence. There was deception. We spoke about border control. And we don't really have time to discuss a lot of the politics that happened, but let's just consider. Anyone can claim they did something. Anybody, even if the Russians, the, if in Russia did do it, and some people said there were actual IP addresses of the Russian government there. Again, spoof the tax, botnet the tax, we can't be sure. But what if I planted the Russians' email there? Or they planted it, or somebody else did? This wasn't the case in this particular issue. Again, a lot of spoof the tax, a lot of botnet the tax. Perfect plausible deniability. It's really cool. It's, it's strategy on a higher political level. Um, the reason why this is the first internet war. Excuse just, me, Gary. Yes. Uh, you you got to make quick to make maybe a few 30 seconds questions answers. 30 seconds. I, I don't have time you to have go all to this. stop in a couple of minutes, maybe okay. five 30 or seconds. six. 30 seconds. Okay. To finish this strategy part, I would like to quote something in Hebrew from the Bible. And I'll quote it poorly because I don't know the exact quote, quote to the English Bible, which is, in cunning and tricks you'll wage war. So things, things, things like things didn't really change over the past few thousand years. We can really learn from all this. The political awareness is why this is the first internet war. It's not really a war. Maybe it is. There, we have seen other attacks of bigger proportions on some ways. There are some new things here which are pretty cool. 
But because of the political awareness, because it reached political level, because they called for NATO, and let's not even discuss what NATO did or didn't do, this is the first internet war. On the left here is Hilar from the Estonian cert. That's me, of course, same shirt, OpenBSD, and just for the sake of it, remember the save server, server they put up at preparations? The only server to survive throughout the whole attack and ever be affected is the firewall they put on that protected network, which is OpenBSD. Never even flinched. And that's Ivor over there from the Estonian cert. And now I'm really sorry we didn't have time to discuss strategy a little bit more. Um, Questions, and thank you very much.